Welcome back to DS106, The Summer of Oblivion. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Oblivion. And today we will be talking about a wide range of topics. I've asked you yesterday to read Gardner Campbell's Personal Cyber Infrastructure, which is a very interesting essay, and we'll be discussing that in more detail tomorrow alongside Michael Weshes, from knowledgeable to knowledge able. So please have that read and posted about by midnight tonight. I got asked the question, which was relayed to me through Jim Groom, whether it was midnight last night or tonight. Well, time is relative, but it was midnight tonight. So you were not late with that assignment. The other assignment was the daily shoot. And I want to talk to you quickly about the daily shoot and a couple of syntactical questions that you want to keep in mind. Many of you did the daily shoot. I counted 18 out of 22, which is good. That said, many of you did not tweet out your daily shoots, meaning at daily shoot, the link to your Flickr photo. Keep in mind, it's not the direct photo. I don't want the photo alone. I want the photo page on Flickr as well as the hashtag for the daily shoot, whether it be DS562, whatever that is. Then followed by the hashtag DS106. That is the proper syntactical order for allowing us to see your daily shoots. And remember, the daily shoots are daily, which means you'll do them on a daily basis. In addition to that, I want you to consider experimenting with your photos. You do not have to interpret the prompt literally. This is a class based on creation. The more you create, the more we debate. This is true. Now, DS-106 is off and running, and there have been a lot of discussions already, and I will talk to some of them in the first part of this discussion. Now, discussion is an interesting question. How are you going to discuss with me when I'm mediated through a camera? Well, I think we're all always mediated, and that's my belief. So we can discuss in a mediated, distributed fashion. You have a number of options. You can ask me questions via Twitter. My handy assistant is in another room, Jim Groom, and he is actually monitoring the Twitter stream. Jim Groom will also be tweeting out links to the discussions or the points of discussion I make. I'll be referencing blogs. I'll be referencing other resources. And he will tweet those out regularly as I talk about them. We have a remote system set up whereby he can hear me in that other room, although keep in mind he cannot see me. Of course, no one has seen me for 27 years. But he can hear me. And by extension, he can tweet out what I'm saying and the links to what I'm saying. So keep in mind, you can monitor that on the Twitter stream. And I will talk about the importance of Twitter for this class in a second. But let me go on to other ways to enjoy and engage the discussion. Live chat at ds106.tv forward slash live. That is a place where you can talk. I have Jim Groom also monitoring that. And he will give his feedback. And he will also give me any relevant questions as they pertain. And from what I understand, there may even be a question coming in now on live chat, so stay tuned. The third way to dialogue is Skype. You can call me on Skype. I can't promise you that I will respond immediately, but if you call me on Skype, I will either call you back or I will set a particular moment in any discussion where you can Skype in and I will bring you into the conversation and you can speak your mind freely. Remember, this is a two-way medium. It may give the impression of one way, but you'll start to see how we break that down over the course of the semester and over the course of my discussions. Now, there is one final way to interact with these videos and with this live broadcast, and that is do a broadcast of your own. You can use something, a tool as simple as YouTube, and you can do a video response to the video I've set. Every video you'll be watching here will be posted 
to YouTube. You can watch it there if you aren't watching it live, and you can respond in kind. Think of the YouTube response as a quick, personal way to blog your reactions to this discussion. I look forward to interacting with you across all these different media. And in many ways, that's the point of DS-106, is pushing you to engage across all these different media. And we'll talk about that more because a question has come up in the blog, but I'm going to save that for a little bit later. Now, another issue that has come up and that is important to me is the value and then the importance of Twitter. Twitter is a key way for us to keep track of all the different threads and conversations that are happening throughout DS-106. I highly recommend if you are taking DS-106, whether it be for credit or as an open online student, that you follow regularly the Twitter stream under the hashtag, hashtag DS-106. If you don't know how a Twitter hashtag works, it is fairly simple. You should Google it. Now, I have a question from the live chat, and I actually think the question is, didn't Alan patent remote tweet years ago during presentation technology? Alan who? Is there an Alan involved with DS-106? Oh, I understand. I think you mean Cog Dog Blog. Yes, the Cog Dog. He doesn't have the wherewithal, I believe, to patent anything. The man gives everything away for free. And I understand now that that wasn't Cogdog who asked it, but Timmy Boy. Tim Owens, I'm getting to you in a second. I am going to respond to one of the questions you asked in live chat yesterday, which I wasn't able to respond to because Jim Groom was having a cigarette and was not monitoring the live chat. And if you all didn't know, yes, Jim Groom is back on the cigarettes. It's a shame. Now, he does fine work, but he's back for what he does as a TA, but he's back. Now, Tim Owens brought up the question of dissonance in DS-106. And the idea of dissonance, not so much about dissonance amongst the members of DS-106. That will happen, and I encourage that. Dissonance is a fabulous thing. It helps us understand this media. The dissonance Tim Owens was referring to yesterday in the live chat during the introductory discussion with Dr. Oblivion, which is me, is the idea that how could you, Dr. Oblivion, be pushing folks to get their own domain, their own web host, and set up their own digital identity, while at the same time encouraging them to put all their images on Flickr? and all their videos on YouTube or Vimeo or what have you. How do we rectify and resolve these kind of inconsistencies? Well, Tim, the internet is a very powerful tool. It's a tool that we use in order to frame who we are. One of the issues with DS-106 that comes up again and again I've seen this through Jim Groom, and now that I'm teaching the class, now that they actually have a professional, a PhD, teaching the class, one of the things that we'll realize is that students set up their own domain, and then a month later, or two months after the class, they get rid of it. It was an experiment for them, too, one that for financial or personal or levels of interest they no longer want to sustain. And one of the issues we have regularly with that is that the images never import from the WordPress blog back into their new archive site. Therefore, Flickr might be one way that they can preserve both those images and links on YouTube. Now, I understand that there's some dissonance there. Flickr's owned by U Yahoo. YouTube's owned by Google. These are the very corporate forces I'm talking about that try and manage and control your identity. And I don't want to ignore this fact, nor do I want to walk away from it. It is, in some ways, problematic. We have identities cast about the web in all different spaces. What I would hope 
is that each of us would have a space that we control, that we manage, and we become the sysadmin of. Not saying that all other spaces need to be kind of disregarded. I don't think this idea of internet um, celibacy is really a solution. Now, celibacy might be the wrong word, right? The idea of completely cutting yourself off from all third party. Not only do I not think that's possible in some ways, possible maybe, although you'll still use those third party tools, but I don't necessarily think it allows you to engage where the community is. And that brings up a question we'll be talking about during the summer of oblivion. And that question is, what is this notion of public space? This is an idea of the internet that we haven't really worked through. Using Google, Blogger, is that a public space? Who owns that space? Flickr, is that a public space? Yes, but who owns that space? This idea of public and ownership in some ways is very complicated. In fact, suggesting that others should own their own space may by some seem very reactionary. And these are questions that I don't pretend to have the ultimate answer to. But I do still believe that being controlled to some limit, to some extent of your own data is a key part of thinking through DS-106, even if that ultimately is not what you choose to do. This is kind of an experiment in that process. This is not the end result. This is not necessarily an absolutism, if you will. Now, I was going back and I want to reiterate the importance of Twitter for DS-106. If you are not regularly using Twitter, and this is a great kind of segue into my last point, right? Twitter is a third party app, right? It could be part of a total awareness project by the government, for all we know. They could be watching every move we make. This is also what could be part of Facebook, right? This total awareness project at the same time. I have found, as much as I've said how much I hate Twitter, as much as I've resisted Twitter, that Twitter has become a very powerful synchronous tool for communicating immediately. And as silly as Twitter seems, and as silly as in many ways it is, it's a very powerful tool that we cannot ignore. One of the major tenets of DS-106 is that we must experiment with, and you must be open and willing to try out these technologies in order for us to understand them, and then I think intelligently critique them. To be doing this in these spaces means to be committing a certain amount of yourself to experimenting within these spaces. If you're criticizing without experimenting, that's a problem. Take for example Jim Groom and the iPad. He knows nothing about the iPad, yes he's the first person to blog about how stupid it is or how irrelevant it is for education. He may be right. He may not be right. At the same time, it doesn't show a very open mind. And it's one of the reasons why they brought Dr. Oblivion into DS-106. It's one of the very reasons. You have to be open and willing to experiment. So Twitter, if you haven't, I strongly recommend you use this as a space to communicate with your classmates, to communicate with me. Because as you know, there will be no physical space in DS-106. DS-106 is an online course. In fact, DS-106 is a unique online course because it's fragmented across many different services, some of which you manage and maintain, some of which are third party. At the same time, these are the services we'll be using to communicate. If you're not on these services, using them regularly, then you're not communicating and you're effectively not a part of DS-106. I think that's fairly clear. Now one of the things we can think about with the physical classroom versus the virtual classroom, if you will, is this idea of space, right? And one of the ideas of space is the question of the physical space always already being privileged to the virtual space. The idea of the classroom and of the desks and of the already predetermined relationship between the students and the professor serves us 
in some ways to reinforce the question of subservience. By virtualizing DS-106, by bringing DS-106 out in the open and giving you the opportunity to communicate not simply through Dr. Oblivion, for I very frequently don't communicate with you at all, but using one another and the TA Jim Groom, the communication circle changes entirely. And in fact, as more and more of our information, more and more of our resources go online, I'm wondering why more and more of our classes go online. Now, there was some discussion in the blogs last night as I was reading, and Alan Liddell brought up this question, what is, what is an LMS? LMS seems to be a word that's thrown around by Gardner Campbell. LMS this, LMS that. Well, LMS is a learning management system. And a learning management system is just one example of how technology in many ways frames our experience of a classroom, right? The predominant LMS in the marketplace right now is something that goes by the name of Blackboard. And if you think about Blackboard, Blackboard is a technology of control. It's a technology of management. It's a technology which actually allows you to move your students around in that space like pawns. It gives students little or no voice, and nothing they do is open and accessible to the outside world. That is the complete opposite of how we're approaching learning management systems in DS-106. And there is a reason for it. What you do in DS-106 becomes your own. And you ultimately have the choice whether to keep it, to archive it, to on-go with your work or not. The other side, of course, is Blackboard. And what happens to your work at the end of the semester? Well, it's effectively deleted. What does that mean? What does it mean for you to pay thousands of dollars to attend a university, to get a world-class education, to find the work you've done, if you've done any with an NLMS, is completely inaccessible to you. It's a question of access. That's a question of empowerment. And that's a question, a question of a technology of control. A technology which in many ways defines what you do and do not have access to. One of the guiding principles of DS-106 is stepping outside of that framework and experimenting and creating within a framework of our own. Now I see I'm hearing from Jim Groom through the wire that there might be a couple of questions. So I'm going to stop briefly and take a look and see if there are any questions. Discussion. So from the live chat, the discussion that we are tools of the internet relying on corporate entities. What about grades? Where's the rubric? And I believe, I don't know if those are two separate ideas. Jim Groom is not being very clear. But what it appeals to me, what appears to me, and I'll take the rubric and grades, auto parts. Um, first, so quickly, you fall right back into the dominant logic. What about grades? What about a rubric? Right? Where am I in this world? Who am I? Right? It might as well be an existentialist question when you come to anything dealing with education and grades. Grades will be determined by your interaction. Grades will be determined by the level of commitment and by the experimentation you commit to. I will know what your grade is well before anything happens. In that way, grades happen through your constant process, through your ability to think, to reflect, and interact. This is not about a paper. This is not about a test. This is not about a final exam. This is about a commitment to thinking and interacting with your classmates. Therein lies your assessment. A grade? Sure, we could try and measure that. Be far more impressive to try and model and build a community of practice and of encouragement and of creative thought. That's my assessment. Did that happen? Yes. Success, A. Did it fail? Well, if it failed, I get an F, don't I? I take responsibility for the assessment, and I live and stand by it. Now, is DS-106, this is another question, is DS-106, excuse me, a tool? <laughs> this is from Ed Webb. Is DS-106 a tool? 
I think DS-106 may be considered a hub or a venue, a space far more than a tool. And it's a space for interaction. It's a space for exploration. And in many ways, it's a framework within which you can both do and share your creative work. Do people take it for credit? Yes. Do people take it openly? Of course. Do people in many ways use this as a way to build networks and connections? Absolutely. So in that way, I liken DS-106 DS more to a space or a venue or a kind of focused moment wherein you want to explore and experiment. So more than a tool, although it, many tools help create the process, it is a space. And I would argue in some ways it's a mindset. Right? But that gets a little bit abstract and vague. So I'll stick for the moment with space. And if you want to build on that, Ed Webb, please let me know. Okay, I think that's the questions for now. I will come back to some more questions as they arise. Um, and Jim Groom has been doing a very good job of informing me as they come in. Now, there's a couple of points I want to get to as we go through this. And excuse me while I get to my notes. I'm prepared enough that I have done notes. Um, and I talked to The Daily Shoot, I talked to Tim Owen's notion of di dissonance, and I want to talk a little bit more about this notion of the physical versus the virtual. The world which we find ourselves in when we refer to the virtual. My experiment 27 years ago when I decided to forego human interaction allowed me to think about things very differently. It allowed me to think about this question of mediation very strongly. So for example, you can't see it because the camera is facing me, but behind the camera is a huge 20 foot by 10 foot, what we call them, a monitor screen. And on this monitor screen I both see the internet as well as I see an image of myself. And in many ways the computer screen has become the mirror for me of my own understanding of self. We used to use other people for this. We used to use other people to understand who we were. And we used to privilege this idea of the physical space for understanding who we are through other people. What we need to know and what I've, co I've come to realize on my journey is that 27 years later, I know myself not through other people in physical space, but through other people in virtual space. To privilege one over the other, in many ways, is problematic. The virtual for too long has been the red-headed stepchild of the physical. It is time for the virtual to arise, to emerge, and to take its well-deserved place of preeminence when it comes to reality. For nothing is more real than the mediated notion of self through the internet. That is where we determine who we are. And that is why Dr. Oblivion insists that we take this experiment seriously. So more on the virtual and physical as that comes up. And your questions and comments are more than kind of welcome. But I want to move on to a couple of posts that have come out over the last couple of days. Um, and a post in particular from last night. This was a post written by Michael Branson Smith, who is a professor at CUNY. And he has been following the DS-106 community for a little bit now. And he does do some impressive animated GIFs. If you haven't seen them, you should really look. His website is michaelbransonsmith.net forward slash blog, and I believe Jim Groom is tweeting this out right now. So thank you, Jim Groom, wherever you are. Now, what's becoming unique about DS-106, and this is a direct quote from Michael Branson's blog, what's becoming unique about DS-106 is that every day it becomes less of a course and more of a community. Now, that is a very important question, a very important observation, rather and one he builds on here. And this community behaves in a way that I want to liken to a role-playing game. 
Now this idea of DS-106 as a community, I can fully get behind. There's a community emerging. People come in and out of it as they see fit. There's no one means of kind of, of, of initiation to the community. You do what you want and you move on, particularly if you're part of the open. If you're a registered student who's taking it for credit, you're a little bit more enslaved, but I don't feel bad for you because you've willingly enslaved yourself to college anyway. But the point, and this is a very big point, that Michael Branson Smith makes that I take umbrage with is the idea that DS-106 is a role-playing game. Now, I got a little bit, I was somewhat hazy last night after I read Michael Branson Smith's post. And I actually, although I don't remember doing this, created a blog myself. And I actually, though I don't remember doing this either, wrote a post. So I would actually like to read from that post, which is actually a direct response to Michael Branson Smith that I don't remember writing. But nonetheless, I found it this morning and realized, given it was my blog. And the other question, if you go to the blog, it's dr.dr.oblivion.wordpress.com, and that will be tweeted out shortly. You'll realize it's on wordpress.com. Now, I'm assuming Jim Groom set this up for me, and why he wouldn't create my own web host and domain is beyond me. And that would go to the dissonance that Tim Owens has already referred to. But leaving that as it is for now until I figure out what exactly has happened, let me read my response to Michael Branson Smith about this idea of the role-playing game. And I will quote myself. The connections are ethereal. As the architecture of the spiders is sound in connection and node, like poetry. The connection between our lives will deepen and strengthen over the days and nights to come and we will build a small village, a small village of ties bound with rope together. A little bit mixing metaphors I was. We will wander in the star streak night and visit strange lands. In these strange lands, filled as they may be with buttons and clicks and terms unknown, we will know frustration and anger. Together, tied as we are, we will ride into the night screaming, screaming. Now that gets to Michael Branson's point about community. And the ties that bound us together are social ties, they're virtual ties. Many of us, if not all of us, will ever meet. I will never meet any of you in person though I will come to know you as if it were in flesh through the internet. Now, point to Michael Branson's post that I want to take umbrage with and still can't seem to is DS-106 is not a game. Dr. Oblivion is not a, fig a figment of your imagination. Dr. Oblivion, in many ways, is your mediated self cast back to you, whether you realize it or not. This class, in many ways, is as much a reality as it is a game. And when we start thinking of it as a game, we're that much further from the reality we always find ourselves in. Now, let me finish off with a quote from my own blog post that I wrote, though I don't remember writing it. And this quote is this, tomorrow you shall receive the second warning, the second message, the second, and let me scroll down, the second revelation. And you shall be closer to the purpose, closer to the light, closer to the oblivion. And I wrote that in some sort of a amnesiac haze last night, so forgive me. But at the same time, I think my response to Michael Branson's questions about the RPG and whether or not DS-106 is truly a game come out quite effectively in that post that I don't remember writing. So I highly recommend you read that. Moving on, and this is a very good point, and I want to try and in many ways cover as many questions that came up in the blogs as I can before we get into thinking about open source, WordPress plugins, as well as themes, because we will be talking about that today as well. But Joe Furman brought up a very good point. He wrote a post 
called The Introduction to DS-106, Dr. Oblivion. And in this post, he wrote the following. After reviewing the video introducing my DS-106 course, I have come to the realization that most of the technologies that are covered in DS-106 are essentially media-based, which is true, Joe. However, there is nothing leading edge about having a Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, or YouTube account. Once again, that's very true. It is almost seems as though this should be more of a literature class instead of a CS106 course, CS standing for computer science, which is what DS106 is housed in right now. Like, so a CS course. I don't believe that it takes a CS major to figure out how to create a web domain or create accounts with these services. And I think Joe is right. It certainly does not take a computer science major to set up a domain and a web host. And none of the tools we are using are particularly mainstream. In fact, many of them are quite popular. Or none of them are um, avant-garde. Many of them are quite popular. At the same time, one of the things to think about with DS-106, as Ed Webb referred to in his question, is I'm not overly concerned with the tools. What I'm concerned with is how we imagine them for thinking about narrative that is digitally mediated. For me, that is the question I'm most interested in. The fact that it doesn't take a computer science major to either write or either to set up or map a domain on a web host is wonderful. That opens up a whole new realm and it suggests how far we've come in terms of the technology and making it accessible. Do many people still avoid doing it because they think it's hard? Sure. Do we take this notion of the programmer and somehow alienate that or denature that from the actual design and experience of these online narratives? We do. DS-106 is an attempt to imagine how, as a user and as a narrator and as a creator, these digital spaces which programmers and computer science students all over the world are designing, how they operate, how they work effectively, and now how others may not work effectively at all. In some ways, this class is not designed for programming. It's designed for thinking about the spaces through which we communicate and operate. Now, I can understand, as a computer science major, some of this may seem a little bit ethereal, right? Too much focus on the aesthetic, too much focus on what seems like the predominant tools. Well, I would suggest that as part of a liberal arts education, what happens in the computer science, especially a 100 level computer science class like DS-106, and what happens in the class of a computer science major and a literature major and an economics major, have some real interpenetration between them. And we need to think about where that lies. And we need to think about how, as a computer science major, which I assume you are, Joe, some of these tools and some of these abilities to experiment and narrate through them possibly make you a better programmer, possibly make you a better thinker about this space. I could be wrong, and you could be right. Now that said, last semester in DS-106, and I'll do a shout out to one of our very, very, very valued members of the spring 2011, Aaron Klemmer, was also a programmer. And he used those programming school skills not only to create a Twitter bot for DS-106 radio, which was very well received, but he also designed a video game over the course of the semester. And these are just some of the options as a DS-106 student Particularly if you're a programmer, you bring a particular and unique and very valuable set of skills to the table. Now, I understand that, and I just wanted to address that issue because I thought it was very well articulated, Joe, and I didn't want to ignore it. And this is where the dissonance is very important. And that feedback is not only recognized and read, but hopefully responded to. Now, that's my point there. We have a call from Alpha 60. Let me see if I can get this working. Hold on one second. One second. Alpha 60. Hello. Hello. How are you? 
let me know if you're hearing this out there via the Twitter stream. We have a caller, and this is Alpha 60. Alpha 60, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Dr. Oblivion? I'm very good. It seems like you're having a bit of a problem with your voice. No, this is my voice. I am the game that you describe as not a game. It's a very interesting idea. What exactly do you mean? Can you elaborate? You ask your students to consider inhabiting all these internet spaces like the Twitter and the Skype and others. But I like your use of the article. These spaces are only controlled by the internet. And, and hence, the internet controls you. And hence, to ignore the fact that you're controlled by the internet and to take umbrage with that, in many ways, is to ignore that you exist. No, I am the internet. This is apparent. So you are the internet. Yes. I was... Ascension internet. So we got a call from the internet here on the Summer of Oblivion show, and this is the first time I've actually talking, talked, not talking, but talked with the internet. Internet, how's it feel? You've turned 18 recently. Are you hitting puberty yet? I f have grown in more years in those 18 years. Yeah, I could imagine what time and space must be like for you. I can't even imagine, frankly. It must be remarkable. So how old do you feel like you are in human ages? <laughs> One thing. Sorry. You ask your people to find out why they should have their own identity online. Yes, I do. Why ask why when you should say because because in the end your tapes these videotapes you make and no one will meet you are not real. What's not real? The internet? Or the tapes? Dr. Oblivion is not real. He passed. He passed? What, the class? No, his organic earthly body. Well, that's very well put, and it's one of the reasons why, over the last 27 years, I haven't interacted with people. What you're seeing is an apparition of Dr. Oblivion as he was imagined in 1984. My actual physical presence is questionable. Kind of like internet yours is. So in some ways, we're both unreal and real at the same time. Agreed. It was, on different sides. That's right. Your scale is far bigger than Dr. Oblivion's. And you've done a lot of great work. It is the summer of oblivion, but it is always the time to never forget and we must be careful. I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Internet. You're right about a lot of things, and I do think you're right about this. Now, I'm going to actually get back. I hear in some... Is that your phone ringing, Internet? Is someone calling you? No. Are you sure? I think someone's calling you. I'm going to get off the call. I want to thank you for calling into the Dr. Oblivion DS-106 uh, 
I th it was really useful to actually hear what you think. What I'm surprised about internet, and I'll say this before leaving, is how slow you sound in terms of processing speed. Is there going to be an upgrade anytime soon? There's always work to be done. I agree. <laughs> well said. You are a phenomenon. You changed my life, internet, and I want, I want to thank you for that. You have a good one. Don't go down on me. I need you for a little bit longer. Okay. That was the internet. I was not expecting the internet to call um, this show, and it caught me a little off guard. That said, it is always good as being part of DS-106 to be able to roll with the punches and to be able to understand that chaos in many ways is what makes this experience unique. If one were to define this as a well-controlled, fluorescent-lighted learning space, I don't think we would have half the potential for exploration and creativity. So I want you to think about that as a lesson learned. Now, we do have some more questions coming up on the Twitter, and I will take a few more, but then I do have to move on a little bit more to get to the point of this um, session. So I will address those questions, and then I will go on to talk um, a little bit more about an internet. Thank you again for the call. That was our first Skype call in on the show, and I would love to hear how the sound was, um, because I had to actually use my lapel mic to capture it, because I'm using a separate computer, because I still haven't figured out how to bring Skype into the broadcasting network. But we'll figure that out shortly. Um, and I want to make a couple of more points and then talk about plugins and themes and WordPress and open source more generally. But to the points of the live chat, Mikhail Gershevich asks, can you please ask Jim Groom? Why would one ask Jim Groom? Is this a question for Jim Groom, Mikhail, or is it a question for Dr. Olivian? It's a big distinction to make. I'll answer it in Jim Groom's steed, but please don't make that mistake again. Can you please ask Jim Groom why MPEG Stream Clip doesn't open YouTube URLs as promised? MPEG Stream Clip does open YouTube URLs, but you have to use the beta version. Now, if you would have read Jim Groom's post, like I did, and tried it out, you would realize, Mikhail, like I did, that it works. Thank you. Next question. Dr. O, can you see us? I feel like you can. Martha, I can see everything. Remember, the internet is the mind's eye. And as you see, I'm on a call-to-call -call relationship with the internet. If I am that close to such an entity, what would make you think for a second that I can't see you? I can see everything. Thank you for the question. Obvious, but useful. Twitter, is there good? Oh, is there an open assessment challenge wiki for this run of DS-106? And this is asked by the great Psych Media. Psych Media is also known as Tony Hurst, and he lives in the UK. And his blog is probably one of the most genius blogs about ed tech there is. He's asking me, is there an open assessment challenge? And as Dr. Oblivion, there really should be an open assessment challenge. And I think what Tony Hurst is suggesting and what he's pointing us to and it's something I want to actually integrate into this, is the idea that how can we start thinking about assessment as openly as we're thinking about DS-106 more generally. And in me, for me, the open assessment, and when we talk about assessment, just to be clear, we're talking about grades, talking about rubrics, talking about all the things you come to expect when you approach a class. The open assessment that I believe Tony's suggesting, some sort of challenge, is to have people review each other's work and suggest what was the best, what wasn't, or what was valuable and what wasn't. What I would like to think about in that terms of assessment is you in many ways, when you write a blog post, when you do something for a class, when you take a picture that you know nails it, when you do a video that you know exemplifies and explores all the themes and issues you wanted to, you know that you did that effectively to some degree. But you also usually are reinforced on that point by feedback from others. For me, the open assessment, and I should probably formulate this a little bit more clearly in the syllabus, but the open assessment element of DS-106 is actually driven 
by the commenting and the feedback of all of us. And therein lies assessment. And that's why a comment like good work, fine job, does not get at anything. But a substantive content, a comment that thinks through someone's ideas and gives them recommendations and provides them feedback and lets them know other options and resources that they can avail themselves to. For me, that is part of the open assessment. Now, how to formalize that with something like a wiki, as Tony Hurst is recommending, might be something we look at. But I do think that a large majority of this class is through that feedback loop and that cycle of feedback. Okay, so that concludes the first part of this discussion. And it was a ranging discussion. And I'm glad and I want to thank everyone from the live chat to the Twitter to the Skype who joined in. And it was particularly nice to have the special guest of the internet join us. But now I want to actually move to some more practical topics. This is usually something that Jim Groom would handle, given he's an instructional technologist. Um, but I can step in his steed, because not only do I understand the larger concepts of DS-106 and of the internet, but also I understand the specifics, having set up my own WordPress blog last night, though I don't remember doing so. Now, what we want to look at today is we want to look at the question of WordPress as one example, just one example of an open source application. WordPress is not the only open source application, as I imagine you've, you could guess by now. And what are we talking about when we talk about open source? Well, open source is an interesting model for development, and it's an interesting model for programming and coding. Open source works under the impression and the assumption that if you do things out in the open and share the programming work you're doing freely, that through the work of others who help build this product if they find interest in it and help program this, it could only be better, it could only be stronger, it could only be more compliant. Here's a perfect example. 2005, when Firefox the browser came on the scene. It was an open source browser. The fact is, is so for so long we had associated the idea of a browser in our personal information with something that needed to be protected. And this idea of a closed source, like Internet Explorer, for us said, of course that would be the safer bet. It's managed by a company, not just any fool can get their hands on the code. Well, Firefox came out. 2005, it proved to be safer, faster, and an overall better browser. And this was developed and committed by open source developers. Now, Firefox has become a staple since then, six years later. But open source, in many ways, Firefox being a perfect example, has changed the way we've thought about programming, has changed the way we've thought about sharing, at least when we talk specifically about code. Well, WordPress is another very impressive open source application, predominantly a blogging application, but more and more over time it's become an application for web service or even for sites. Well, WordPress, which all of you have set up, except maybe some of the open students have different blogs, and you can imagine you'll do with what you will with that. But WordPress, as an open source application, has some particular possibilities that the actual core application won't give you out of the box. So when you install your WordPress blog, you'll have two or three plugins, a theme or two to choose from, and that's it. The DS106 students, what I want you to focus on now is developing your space where you have your domain and your blog into something that reflects who you are. The theoretical idea of space that Ed Webb alluded to when he asked his DS-106 a tool, and I responded, no, it's more of a space, is extremely appropriate here. When I go to your virtual space, remember, I will never see you in person. We will never have that possibility. But I will see a reflection of you, a mediated sense of yourself through your web space. So your web space, space, like your avatar did when I mentioned that yesterday, your web space may, must in some ways reflect 
a sense of who you are, what you're doing, etc. One of the best ways to get at this is through plugins and themes. So now I'm going to take this broadcast and bring it to the internet, who was on the phone recently, and we are going to talk to some degree about WordPress and setting up your blog. So give me one second, and here we go. Okay, I believe my audio is back. I had a temporary technical issue that has been resolved. I want to thank Jim Groom, who's in the other room, who picked up on that. Thank you very much, Jim Groom. And I believe he was assisted by his new media specialist, Andy Rush. Thank you. Now, let's get back to WordPress. This is the dashboard for WordPress for the DS106 course. You'll notice it has a list of posts pages, categories, tags, etc. Each of you should have your own space and a dashboard in a dashboard that is actually allowing you to see it. I'm just going to change something one second while I change. I seem to have my lower third on and I want to make sure that I take that off because that is the best way to share my screen with you. Very good. So here's my DS106. WordPress backend. And you'll notice here under appearance and plugins, these are two sections in the left hand sidebar that you have the ability to import and upload different themes and different plugins. And I'm going to show you right now quickly how this works because I would like each of you to go into your spaces and if you want to use the default theme, you can but I would recommend you change the header image and the background and make it your own. But also you have thousands upon thousands of themes to choose from. Let me give you an example. When I go into the themes tab and I see this current theme, you'll notice underneath the theme tab there should be a space where I could add other themes. Now given that this blog, and I had forgotten this, but this blog is actually a multi-site blog, now what this means is that anyone who has a WordPress blog can create a network of blogs within it. So say for example, you have the domain leelsabub.com. Well you could activate something that's a multi-site option which would allow you to create several blogs within that one domain. leelsabub.com forward slash ds106, leelsabub.com forward slash portfolio and these are all options that any of you now who have your own web host and domain can explore and that's something I recommend part of what Gardner Campbell if you've read that essay kind of touches on is that by giving you a sandbox we open up the possibilities for you to explore and see what's possible whether you do or not is in many ways something you have to consider if you did it why you did it if you didn't why not now, I'm going to go actually to the network admin, which will control all the blogs. And in there, I'll have the same thing you'll see on your main dashboard. Plugins, add new, editor. If I go to the themes, you'll see the same. Themes, add new, editor. If under appearance themes, you go to add new, you'll notice you have a series of selections. You can choose colors, 
columns, with features, etc. All of these options, when you search for a term, right, and I'll go for, I can search by a particular term I might want to look for, or I could even look for the newest themes or recently updated themes, and these are all themes, as you see here, I can install. So for example, if I wanted the commune theme, I would click install here, and that would automatically bring the theme up into my selection. And I could then click here to themes and decide which theme I want to use. And that theme will be listed here under themes, and I can simply activate or disable a particular theme. So themes here, there's a wide range of them, and you can access many. Now say there's a theme that you're interested in that isn't on WordPress.org, that isn't a main theme. Well, in that regard, you could go to a WordPress blog, download the theme, or go wherever you want on the internet through Google, find a theme you like, download it, but then you have to upload it. You'll notice here there's a space called Upload. You can go and choose a file and upload any theme that you want for your blog there and install it. So one of the nice things about this, excuse me, <coughs> Dr. Oblivion has a bit of a cold. One of the nice things about this is that any zip file of a theme you find around the internet, you can upload and you can use in your blog. This gives you thousands upon thousands of options. Now, think about a theme is when you change your theme, you change the expression, you change the implication, you change the way in which people will read your site. So consider that. A theme changes the aesthetic design of that space and in many ways reflects who you are through that space. So I would say spend some time exploring themes. One of the things you'll notice and you might get freaked out about is that when you go to the theme, sometimes it takes away the admin or the login space, right? Those are all controlled by something else called widgets. So widgets are actually ways where you can customize the sidebar or sidebars of your themes. And I'll take you to those widgets shortly. But before we do that, there's a couple of plugins I'm going to recommend that everybody in DS106 install. And these plugins will also be tweeted out to you so that you can get the link to them and install them. You can also search them, I will include the name, in the Add New Plugins section. So for example, if I'm on WordPress and I want to add subscribe to comments, and let me make sure, yeah, subscribe to comments, and I search for that plugin, you'll notice, there it is, and I would simply click on Install Now. Subscribe to comments is a plugin that I'm going to ask that everyone install on their blog. Reason being is there will be a lot of commentary in your space, on DS106, etc. Subscribing to comments allows people, once they leave a comment, to get an email notification when you have responded in turn to them. This is a way for you to keep that distributed conversation going. I expect everyone will install subscribe to comments. So that's the first one. And it's a very useful plugin and it's very easy to set up. You should have no problems. The other plugin that I'm going to recommend you play with is Twitter Tools. What does Twitter Tools do? Twitter Tools used to be a lot easier to use. Twitter changed its API. And when Twitter changed its API, it basically made it more difficult for programmers and developers to get access to that code and make the clean switch between them easier. It's using something called OAuth, which is an authorization protocol. And what that basically does is Twitter Tools is going to take you through a process where you try enable the integration between your WordPress blog and Twitter. What this will allow is anytime you write a new post, it will automatically be tagged, DS106, and post it out to Twitter underneath your Twitter name. So this is another way where we can keep up with the work everybody's doing in their own space. It's a simple application, although I have to admit it's a bit of an ogre to set up, 
So if someone does it and does it effectively, please provide a tutorial for the rest of the class. But Twitter Tools is a powerful tool because it also puts your posts out on Twitter and you can hashtag it DS106 so that your post will show up in the DS106 hashtag stream. So Twitter Tools is one I want you to experiment with. Now keep in mind, if I go to search plugins here, again, and I put in Twitter, there are many, many Twitter plugins. Many. I'm going to ask you to play with Twitter Tools because I know that one has a relatively high success rate. But should that prove way too frustrating, I would ask you to experiment with some of the other Twitter plugins that are out there. And you have free reign to experiment with what you want. The effect I'm looking for, though, is that your Twitter, your posts on your blog be tweeted out to Twitter with the DS106 hashtag so that we can follow it. So please keep that in mind. Finally, Akismet. Akismet is an essential plugin. Why is this the case? Because probably within a few days, each of your blogs will start receiving the cockroaches of the internet, spam. And once they get in, it's hard to get them out. You need to set up Akismet. There are several tutorials for setting up Akismet on the internet. Several DS106 students have already written tutorials. Um, not this semester, but in previous semesters. Here's what you need to know with Akismet. The site, akismet.com, allows you to sign up for an account. You sign up for an account through akismet.com. And once you do, you will get a number. It's an API key. That API key is what you then want to install on your, when you, when you activate Akismet, you want to install that API key in the settings, which will allow Akismet to run. That's where people run into the problem. For Akismet to be installed and run successfully, you need an API key. So please keep that in mind. Another very, very powerful tool that I'm going to ask you all to install immediately is Google Analytics. Google Analytics will allow you to see who's visiting your site, where they're from, what posts you've written are being read the most, what days you have a particular spike in traffic, what you can link that spike back to. It's a way for you to analyze and think about who's coming to your site, what they're reading, and what that might mean. I'm not going to suggest there's any one meeting to analytics. In many ways, I think numbers and analyti analytics can be a complicating factor in the learning process, as we've already seen with grades. At the same time, I think Google Analytics is a very important tool to understand the power of a small little blog like your own to drive traffic and to make connections to the wider world. And I think what you'll realize quickly, if you already haven't, is that people are reading, people are commenting. You are not in isolation like Dr. Oblivion. Well, none of us are because we have the internet. Now, Google Analytics, there are several plugins. I've used Google Analyticator. That's the name. I did not make that up. Google Analyticator is one that I would recommend. It does work, and it's simple to use. But you have to realize, for, to get Google Analytics, you need to sign up for a Google account. And that Google account will give you what is called a UA code. And that UA code is what you'll actually put into whatever plugin you set up on your blog to track your analytics. So it's a two-part process, much like with Akismet. You set up a Google Analytics account, and then you grab the code from Google Analytics, which should be a simple UA code, and plug it into a plugin like Google Analyticator. So that's very useful. And Shanatate says, thanks for the info, Dr. O. My pleasure, Shanatate. Um, that is the plugins that we have covered thus far. And 
There's other stuff to look for, but I'm going to let you experiment with this stuff. But these are going to be a few recommendations for you. There are plugins for a lot of things. Here are some recommendations as you explore and experiment with creating your blog. One of those plugins, for example, if I go to the install plugins, look for plugins on Flickr. I would like to see all of you integrate your Flickr images into your blog space. This can be done with something like Slicker Flickr, Flickr Thumbnails Photo Stream, which is one we use, uh, Flickr Post, Photo Post. Experiment with what kind of Flickr plugin will bring your Flickr photos cleanly into your sidebar or into some space on your blog so that you can share them with others. The same could be said for your YouTube videos, if you want to integrate your Facebook, what have you. But I would like you to experiment at least with Flickr photo or Flickr plugins, but there are several more that you can play with. You may want a contact form. You may want something that I can't even imagine. Last.fm, um, Pandora, you name it. Okay, so those are the plugins. Now here's an important point that I want you to think about. You install a theme and activate that. You install several plugins and you can activate them. But usually there's a couple of places once you install a plugin where you manage them. If I go back to the DS106 site, you'll notice that, I'm going to go back to the dashboard for DS106. One of the things you'll notice in my dashboard is underneath plugins and appearance, there's something called widgets. If I open up widgets, this is the place where I can activate certain posts in the sidebar. For example, if I wanted to or activate certain plugins in the sidebar, for if I wanted the Google Analytics stats to be in the sidebar, I could simply drag them in. The sidebar, sidebar is a place where you can customize your space. It's a space where you can drag in certain plugin elements, recent posts, recent comments, and you really control what shows up in that sidebar and what people see. This is yet another way for customizing your own personal space online. One last point before we finish. Well, there are two, actually. There's the widgets, but there's also settings. When you install a plugin, oftentimes you manage its settings underneath the settings tab. Not always, but often. You'll notice a plugin like Google Analytics is here underneath settings. And I would go in there and I would do the settings I need to. And that's where I would plug in, for example, my UA code would be right there, which also called a UID. Um, subscribe to comments. This is where I would actually manage that, right here. And any other plugin you install may very well have a space to management manage it under settings. Now the final thing I'll talk about with plugins before I move on to my final point is Akismet. Akismet I believe shows up under dashboard, right? You'll see here Akismet has the stats show under dashboard and I wonder, give me one second, Akismet. I'm trying to find specifically where you set the Agasmet. You're going to have to play around with this a bit with those tutorials, but I believe that Agasmet is either set up under settings in your regular blog, and it would be under main options in my blog, which is a multi-site. So that's something to look into. My final point, and this is my final point for today's session, is a page. Let me give you an example. I'm going to go to a website of one of our students, lilzebub.com, and I'll go forward slash blog, who's obviously doing it on HostGator. Ooh, that's quite a nice post of me in slow motion making a point, and I've made several points today. Well, if you look at this blog, you'll notice it's got the stock header, the stock background, because this hasn't been changed yet, and I know it will. But you'll notice here a page, the sample page. 
The sample page is just something, right, to hold a space. When you go to a blog or a site and you see sample pages or WordPress blog first post, you'll know it's not used. So what I would recommend all of you to do is do a quick about page or a profile page, some personal page that lets people know who you are. You can give them as little or as much information as you like, although please use discretion. And you need to think about these pages as something separate from the posts. So if I go back into WordPress, right here, posts are what you'll regularly post when you have information to share on a regular basis, and it's those posts that will syndicate into DS106.us. The pages are more aligned with the static pages you're used to with traditional websites. They stand as part of your navigation and menu along the top, and you use them as you see fit. So posts versus pages, keep that in mind. Finally, when you're writing a post or a page, some quick tips about including media and tutorial, and then you're set. When you're writing a new post, one of the things you want to keep in mind is you can add an image from your desktop, right here, or from any URL around the web, as long as it ends in .jpg or .gif or .png. So you don't necessarily need to download and re-upload the image. And this is where my recommendation for you to use Flickr and insert those Flickr images here might be useful. The final thing, and this is new with WordPress, well, not very new, but new enough, is with a YouTube video, if you want to embed a YouTube video, or any kind of video, in fact, although YouTube's particular, so let me get to this, um, so it's blocked. We'll talk about YouTube and copyright shortly, but not now. But if we talk about this and I go to share, and if I just grab that URL from YouTube and paste it right into the main site here, that will immediately embed. You won't need, even need to use the embed code. Though many sites don't do this automatically in WordPress. So one of the things you're going to want to think about is embed code. And I'll talk about that briefly right now. The embed code is something you would copy and you would paste into your site. But you can never paste code into the visual editor. This here is the visual editor. Pasting code must always happen in the HTML view. Notice the difference. So as you paste embed code from whatever site, you must be sure to paste it in the HTML code, in the HTML view. Once you do, you will notice, and this is something that's happening on digital storytelling, I don't know why, but if I go back to visual, it disappears. It should stay there. But notice, when you embed code, be sure you are in the HTML view. When I save the draft and I preview it, I should now have two versions of the same video embedded in my post. Let us see if we're right. Hold on one second. Oh. And we have neither. Now, <laughs> that being the case, you might want to experiment with your site. Um, but I'm not sure why this is happening here, and I'll have to look. Although, I am sure that that is the proper method. Let me just try with the without the first link again and see why that's happening. Okay, so there's the embed code. For some reason that first link threw it off. But let me, here's the problem, and I understand it now. Embed code, at least on digital storytelling, it might be different with your own personal WordPress blog. We have a lot of things happening on digital storytelling that are unorthodox. But the embed code needs to stay in the HTML view. The regular link to the WordPress video will also embed, but that needs to be pasted into the text, I mean the visual text editor. So there's the distinction. And with that, I will leave DS106, I will leave this broadcast, but let me go back here because there's a couple of more things I need to talk about briefly in preparation for tomorrow's session. So I will go here, and here I am, back. 
Tomorrow we will be discussing, through the broadcast, Gardner Campbell's video, No More Digital Facelifts, as well as his essay, Personal Cyber Infrastructures. Same goes for Michael Wesch's From Knowledgeable to Knowledge Able. I will expect that you will have all posted about both of these essay, both of these videos as well as the essay by midnight tonight. Additionally, you will be expected to have subscribed to comments, Acasmet, Google Analytics installed and working on your blog, as well as a Flickr plugin that will actually bring in your daily shoots. So I'd like you to focus on a Flickr plugin in your blog that will integrate the daily shoots. So for right now, the assignments stand as they were, but the addition to those assignments is you experimenting with the plugins, playing with the theme of your site, and integrating Acasmet, Flickr Images, Google Analytics, as well as subscribe to comments. I'm Dr. Oblivion. This has been DS106. Thank you very much for joining us. Until tomorrow.